Good morning, welcome to church. Hey, why don't you guys stand to your feet? We're going to worship the Lord this morning. Come on, we come into his presence and praise with thanksgiving. Happy Father's Day. Come on. The Bible says that we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Come on, that's what we do this morning. We overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. We sing of what he's done for us. sing this truth together. It's a simple truth. It says, if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Come on, he's working with us this morning. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe. Come on. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Yes, God, we sing to you, yeah. Greater things are still to come. Come on. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, you're not done. testimony from there to life cause grace we wrote my story I'll testify come on but Jesus Christ the righteous I'll testify yeah, this is my testimony yeah. this is my testimony from there to life cause grace we wrote my story Good morning, North Star. How are we doing this morning? Y'all feeling good? All right. It is great to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. My name is Corey. I'm one of the pastors on staff here. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us here this morning. All the people in the room this morning, we're 
welcome. Everybody that's joining us online all across our city and possibly around the world, we welcome you in as well. On behalf of everyone here at North Star, happy Father's Day. Can we give it up to all the dads joining us today? All the dads out there, yeah. Happy Father's Day. Dads, we honor you this morning. We are celebrating with you. We are thankful for all that you do. I said in the first service, I can just hear it now. All the dads priming up all their dad jokes for this afternoon to tell their family. I got a couple up my sleeve. I'm ready for this afternoon. I'm going to share. So, honey, wherever you're at, I think she's in here. Just get ready for that. But if you are brand new with us here today, we are honored that you would worship with us. We would love to connect with you. And a really easy way to do that, I'm going to ask everyone, if you're brand new in the room or online, to take out your mobile device and text the word CONNECT to the number that you see on the screen. And what this is going to allow us to do is just to get to know your story a little bit better, to pray with you and for you, maybe answer some questions that you may have about the mission of our church here. And if you're joining us in the room this morning, I want to encourage you, as soon as the service is over, you can go out the back doors and hang a right. You're going to see some tables out there and a sign that says connection point. We're going to have some leaders and some pastors there. They would love to talk to you, meet with you, and also get you a gift. And if you're joining us online, we would love to get you a gift as well. So be sure and take advantage of that today. Well, North Star, we just want to say thanks again so much for your generosity. You know, we've been able to help so many people and impact so many with the gospel of Jesus Christ directly because of your giving. You know, one of our core values here is we give joyfully. So we don't take an offering, we give an offering here at North Star. So today you can be generous in three different ways. You can give on our website, northstarnox.com. You can text to give to the number 84321. It's going to send you a series of prompts to show you how, can, how you can text a, a dollar amount on your phone. And then if you would like to give in person today, you can do that as well. We have some uh, giving stations out in the lobby. So as soon as our service is over, you can drop your gift in there as well. Well, finally, I am so excited to announce this, this last thing. I can hear the parents' excitement already through the screen. We are officially opening NS Kids again on July 12th. Can we give it up for NS Kids? Yes. We, yeah, we are so excited to get kids back on this campus again. Our team has been working so diligently over the last couple of months, putting some precautions in place and planning out what that looks like. Parents, we're gonna have a video coming out very soon just telling you exactly what you can expect when you drop your kids off again on July 12. You know, we need the next generation on this campus again. And we believe God is gonna do a mighty work in the hearts of children on July 12. So we cannot wait. Be praying for our team as we prepare for that Sunday. Well, church, it's a great day to worship a great God, amen? And we're gonna continue in worship right now. I'm gonna pray for us and then we're gonna jump right back into it. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for what you are doing in the life of this church, this body called North Star. Lord, we worship wholeheartedly this morning your son Jesus. Lord, we are thankful for what you're doing in our city and around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning we come, we lift our voices high to you because we believe that you're at work in this room, in living rooms, this morning, Lord, we give you praise for what you are about to do. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, this morning, church, we sing of our God and what he's done for us. Church, we know this song. Let's declare this together. You are here. We sing.
who he is. You are we make a miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. Come on, we sing to who he is. You are we make a miracle work, a promise keep light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. truth this morning. Come on, we sing. Even when I can see it, you're working. Even when I can feel it, you're working. You never stop. Oh, we sing to our God. Yeah. Even when I can see it, you're working. Oh,
light in the darkness oh my god that is who you are because you are the way maker miracle worker promise keep light in the darkness oh my god that is who you are power inside of us and that we do not come to church but we are the church God we live in a heavy time but we know you are working we know you are moving we come full of hope and we believe for your joy and we will believe for breakthrough in this place in the mighty powerful name of Jesus we pray
time we sing. We sing, we lift our voices to Him. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Come on, we lift our voices. We declare that to Him. Come on, it's the name above every other name. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Sing the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. We lift high the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. we lift that name the name that is above every other name the name of Jesus God's what we declare in this place it's what we gathered to lift high the name of Jesus that name the mere mention of that name every storm every bit of chaos in our life has to obey Powerful, what a wonderful, what a beautiful name. Just what we declared. God, we know that now more than ever we need Jesus. When our world is broken, and things seem so turned upside down, and there's hurt and brokenness. We need Jesus. The only name of which we're saved. God, we thank you for all that you're doing. God, how you're moving in this place. God, you are changing hearts and minds and lives every day. So this morning, we take time, we just focus in. God, would you give us eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying to this body we call North Star. God, we love you and we worship you. It's your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Hey, well, good morning, church. Welcome into the house of the Lord. The psalmist says, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Can we just give up a hand clap of praise for the Lord Jesus today? Isn't it good to be back in the house of the Lord? Wow, well, it is Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to all of you. As a matter of fact, if you are a dad, a father in the room today, can you just stand to your feet? Can we celebrate some godly men today? Can you stand to your feet, man of God? Come on, all over the place. Thank God for you. Well, let me take just a moment, if I can, to welcome all of our campuses. We're praying for our South Campus today. We're praying for our Morgan County men of God. Man, what a joy it has been for me to be able to play that role of a spiritual father in many of your lives. And so uh, all of you who are joining online as well today around the globe, I'm thankful to have that honor to be able to be some of your spiritual dads and grandfathers. And wow, man, it's great to have uh, some of my grandsons, spiritual grandsons and, and uh, sons in the house today. Brian and Ryan over here here, man, one of my spiritual sons, my spiritual grandsons in the house today. Just so thankful for so many uh, that God has given me the opportunity to walk with. Today, I'm thankful for my own dad, my father, Martin Cagle. Uh, he was a strong man of God, taught me a love for the Word of the Lord, a love and respect for the house of God. He taught me a great work ethic, how to love people well. Just so thankful for my dad, my biological father. He's in his seventh year in glory. Right now, his seventh Father's Day in heaven. And uh, one day I'll be with him again in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's thankful for all the spiritual dads in my life as well. I kind of think back about that over the past couple of days, man. I'm, I'm really thankful for a guy named Sam Evans. Sam Evans uh, was my Sunday school teacher in middle school. And he realized really quick that my group of boys needed a little extra love and time. And so he just stayed with us, middle school, high school, all the way through college and poured the Word of God into me. I thank God for Sam Evans, just a spiritual father. Uh, another guy named Sam Jolly that I was on staff with my very first church who taught me how to dig deep into the Word of God. Man, I miss uh, my brother Sam Jolly as well. I'm really indebted to Dr. Irvin Cook. Uh, he was the first pastor that I ever served under, taught me how to really 
uh, love and dig out the Word. He was the first guy who uh, believed in me in the area of preaching. He invited me to preach some of my first sermons. And so got a couple of folks in the house today, Terry and Lynn Bennett, love you guys that were there. Uh, some of my very first sermons, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. Uh, but I was learning and growing, and I thank God for, for Dr. Irvin Cook. And I thank the Lord for uh, Dr. Doug Sager who served here in, in East Tennessee and right here in West Knoxville, the First Baptist Concord. I met Brother Doug when I was 18 years of age, and he started kind of mentoring me, pouring into me, and spent a lot of time with Brother Doug. He taught me how to deeply love people and to make the Word understandable and plain in, in the hearts of people's uh, mind and spirits. I'm just thankful for these spiritual fathers. I'm thankful for uh, Coach Ken Sparks, who uh, taught me a lot more about winning football games, but how to win men and women to Jesus and how to live strong as a man of God and what it really looked like to be a man of God. So just honor today to have these spiritual fathers in my life as well. You know, as I think about the church life, it's a bit tragic in one way. You know, we think about uh, days of celebration throughout the church year, and I always think about Mother's Day. You know, it's the third largest attended service every year in America, and the church is Mother's Day. Easter's number one, Christmas is number two, Mother's Day is number three. But then I think about Father's Day. Sometimes one of the least attended services, and we're, we're kind of down. We come in beat down as men of God. Don't think we're good enough, worthy enough. But let me tell you something, men of God. Man, I'm for you today. I love you, and I'm here to encourage you today. I'm here to lift you up by the power of the Word of God through the presence of the Holy Spirit of the Lord. Very important that we learn how to celebrate Father's Day. Now, I'm going to tell you why. I did some research, and recent stats said this, uh, that fatherless children in America are five times more likely to commit suicide. You realize that? Interesting. Sons or daughters without a dad. They are seven times more likely to be involved in a teenage pregnancy. They are eight times more likely to be imprisoned sometime in their lifetime. Fatherless children, boys and girls without a dad. They, they are nine times more likely to drop out of high school. They are ten times more likely to be uh, battled with substance abuse. They are 20 times more likely to have behavioral problems. This is interesting. That you know that in America, uh, that 80% of the men who commit the crime of rape have no fathers, no biological or spiritual fathers in their life. This is important. This is so significant that we have spiritual dads. They, they are 32 times more likely to run away from home. 90% of the homeless population in America are men and women who had no dads in their life had no biological spiritual fathers in their life. They're 33 times more likely to be seriously abused. They are 73 times more likely to be fatally abused, boys and girls who grow out without a dad in their life. This is important. Oh, man, this is serious stuff. This is vital today. But it's not a new story. It really begins um, in my mind, in my heart, in the book of Malachi. So the very last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, Here's what's going on. These are the last words from God through the prophet Malachi. And then there's 400 years of silence. There is no word of God until John the Baptist arrives on the scene in the Gospels. So this is the very last word from God in the Old Testament. Last chapter of the Old Testament. The last two verses of the Old Testament. And here's what it says. He says, in the last days, listen to this. He said, God will turn the hearts of fathers back to their children and the hearts of children back to their fathers or else I will bring a curse on all the nations of the world. It is possible, listen, it's possible that we are living under this curse. Because there are so many young boys, so many young girls that, that have been raised without biological dads in their life, raised without spiritual fathers in their life. That brings us to our text for this morning. And so I want you to grab a Bible. I hope you have a copy of the Word of God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're going to pick up at verse 14. You can find it on your phone, or you can track along with us on the big screen at all of our campuses today. And so the Apostle Paul has a word to say about this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 15. Listen to this. Look at it on the screen. Read it in your Bible. Paul says, even if you had 10,000 guardians in Christ... You do not have many fathers. Although you may have 10,000 teachers, tutors, schoolmasters in your life, there are not many 
followers. Oh, this is so interesting. So I did a little homework here. I looked into the Greek manuscript, and, and this word guardian here is the Greek word pedagogos. And here's what it means. It means a schoolmaster, a teacher, a tutor. And so Paul's saying, hey, man, you may have had 10,000 tutors to speak into your life, men or women of God who were teachers in your life, who were instructors in your life, but there are not many fathers, Greek word petar, P-A-T-E-R. And this means someone who would nourish you spiritually and bring you to a place of maturity. How many in the room today are thankful that God gave you a biological father or a spiritual father who nourished your life and raised you up to a place of maturity? Can I see hands in the room? Man, praise God for our spiritual father. So important. But Paul is noting the fact that there are not many spiritual fathers. And it's important. And so I want to kind of give you a little bit of insight right here of, of what this looks like. As you drop down real quick in the first Corinthians chapter 4 verse 20, here's what the Word of God says. Paul says, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Oh, my word. Here's what I believe. I believe we're living in generations now, generations X and Y, who are saying, hey, we've talked about it long enough. I've heard you, Dad. I've heard you, men. I've heard you talk about it long enough. I'm looking for a man of God full of the Holy Spirit of God who will rise up in my presence and live out the gospel with power and anointing over their lives. This is what we're hungry for. This is what men and women are hungry for. I guarantee you, if I could take a poll, and I'm not going to do that today, but if I could take a poll in this room and across our city and across our region of young men and women that are Generation X and Generation Y, they would say, oh, I'm desperate for a man of God who will raise up and not just talk about it anymore, but would live out the gospel with power and authority and anointing in their life. Oh, we have a need for spiritual fathers in our city today. People are hungry for it. It doesn't happen by accident. You know that. It happens when you and I become intentional about it. So I want to take you on a little journey today through the Word. I want you to jot some things down in your spiritual notebook, in your journal, in the margin of your Bible. I want to talk about what a real spiritual father does. Can we talk about that for a moment? What do real fathers do? Here's number one. They warn but they never shame. Oh, this is so important. Real spiritual fathers, they warn, but they never shame. And would you look at verse 14? 1 Corinthians 4, 14. He says, I am writing this not to shame you, there it is, but to warn you as my dear children. You know, the Apostle Paul saw every one of the believers in the city of Corinth as his spiritual children. He's like, man, you're my son, you're my daughter, you're my son, you're my daughter. He saw every one of them as his children, so he's speaking to them with real tenderness here. And he said, I'm writing this to you not to shame you, but to warn you. Here, here's what the word warn means, to correct or to train, to set back on track. When, when I was a little boy, my brother and I, at Christmas time, got race cars. You know, now everything's RC. It's all remote control, right? You can, you can fly a drone, you can fly a helicopter, you can run a car or a jeep you know anywhere you want to in the room but when I was a little boy they had to stay on the track and they had a little metal track there and they had brushes under there and it was run by electricity and the sparks would fly and my brother and I would get these little controllers you know that were connected to the track and and you push the button down to make it go faster slower faster slower faster slower you remember that anybody remember those old uh, cars all right we got some old people in the house today praise God for that love old people I'm one of them. And so my brother and I would get there. You know, we'd line the red car up and the blue car up and at the starting point, and we'd go, and we'd take off, and around this racetrack it would go. And so we'd set the number of laps, and the closer it got to the end, the more we wanted to win, the faster we would run the cars. We'd push the buttons down until all of a sudden you're running so fast when you go around the corner, whoosh, the car just go flying off and hit the wall somewhere. And the race is over. You lost. And this is what spiritual fathers do. They don't shame you. They don't scold you. They don't embarrass you. They just say, hey, it'd be really important for you to slow down just a little bit. I'm going to put your car back on the track. Is this is what spiritual fathers do. They warn you. Oh, this is important. Pay attention to what I'm saying right now. They warn you to correct you, put you back on track, but they don't shame you. What does this word mean? Well, the word shame here, it means to crush your spirit, to break your heart to embarrass you. You ever had a dad or a spiritual dad 
embarrass you, shame you, break your spirit, crush your heart. Dads, I, I want to speak to you right now just from my heart. I've not been a perfect dad, and I know there have been times in the life of my two children to where I probably have shamed them or broken them or wounded them in some way. But can I just say how important, Dad, listen to me, how important your words are, how much your children love and value you. you. And, and the Bible says in Proverbs that our words have the ability to breathe life and death. And by how you speak to love and affirm your children, man, it, it can lift them up. It can break them down. Let me give you a tip. Here's, a, here's my tip. Here's what I've lived by. You ready for this, Dad? Always affirm your children publicly and discipline them privately. Oh, let me say that again. Somebody needed to hear that. Oh, you're going to carry that away from here. This is going to be a treasure. It's going to be a nugget for you, right? You ready? Here's, always affirm your children publicly and discipline them privately. Oh, man, I brag on your sons. Brag on you. Put your arm around. I'm so proud of this boy. I love this girl. They are amazing in front of your family, in front of their friends. Lift them up. Encourage them. Speak well of them. Oh, I'm going to tell you, Dad, that your words speak life, and it'll raise them up, and it'll give them confidence, a godly confidence like never before. But when you have to say the hard word, when you have to call them out, do it privately. Not in front of their friends and family. Don't embarrass them. Don't break their heart. Don't break their spirit. Don't shame them. So what do real fathers do? Number one, they warn, but they never shame. Number two, they lead by example. Look at verse number 16. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, this word in the Greek means I plead or beg with you to what? Imitate me. Wow. This is a big deal right here. Paul said to the whole church at Corinth, all of these new believers, he says, look at me, watch me, imitate me, mimic me. Have you ever had a child mimic you and how they talk or how they walk or how they treat somebody? Have you ever seen yourself in the life of your children? I had a, a friend uh, years ago who was a, a a contemporary Christian musician named Tony Ellenberg. And Tony uh, had polio when he was a child. And so he, he walked, he always walked with a limp. And he tells this powerful story uh, about his little son, Tanner. And so uh, he, he, he has a little boy. And so one day Tony's out mowing his grass with a push mower and he just walks with a limp, you know? He just naturally walked with a limp everywhere he went. And he had no idea, but his wife was documenting this with a camera from inside the house. And his little four-year-old boy was out behind him with his little tykes mower, the one you to push and the bubbles come up out of it. And he was walking right behind his dad mowing the grass. And when he was walking, he was walking with a limp because he wanted to be just like his daddy. Oh, my word. If we could ever grab a hold of this spiritual truth today, that there are young men and women who are looking for godly spiritual fathers that they can be just like. I want to imitate you. I want to follow your example. Godly fathers lead by example. Here's the deal. Kids will most of the time do what you tell them, but they oftentimes become what you are. Did you hear what I just said? Oh, you better take note of that, Dad. Your children, most of the time, We'll do what you tell them. But ultimately, they will become what you are. So are we, are we today as men of God, as fathers, as spiritual dads, are we living, can we be honest with ourselves, are we living a life in such a way, in such a manner, according to the Scripture, according to the Holy Spirit of God, that we could actually say to our sons and daughters, imitate me, do what I do, say what I do, live the way I live. Give the way I give. Love the way I love. Can we? Are we that confident? We're not perfect men, but boy, we're striving to be like Jesus in every way. Because at the end of the day, uh, your sons will be the same kind of dads you were. Your sons will be the same kind of coach you were. Your sons and daughters will have the same kind of marriage that you have. Uh, your, your kids will, will, will be much like you in their work ethic and their passion. So, so real fathers, they warn but never shame they lead by example. Number three, they instruct on key issues of life. They instruct on key issues of life. Now, I could spend several hours talking about this third point, but for sake of time today, I just want to look at three real quick, can we? Uh, stay with me now. So, so there are three things here that I want you to see from the Apostle Paul as a spiritual dad to the church at Corinth. He talks, first of all, about sexual purity. 
Oh, man, is this ever important in our day and age and our culture, Dad? Grab a hold of this. Go to chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. He starts talking about sexual immorality. He says in verse 12, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. You say food for the stomach and stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. But, but watch this now. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. In verse 15, he says, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ Jesus and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Exclamation point. Verse 16. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. Can I time out here? I want you to understand, Dad, it's so important for your sons and your daughters to understand that when they are uh, sexual promiscuous and they connect themselves with a man or a woman there's something unusual that takes place there there's there's a connection a bond here the two become one flesh and so I just want you to understand dads it's so important that we talk to our children our sons and our daughters about the importance of sexual purity that they would keep themselves for their husband or their wife for a day of marriage and it's a beautiful God-given gift oh we got to be so careful about this now look at verse 18 he says, flee from sexual immorality. You know, in America, oftentimes we teach our sons especially that we're supposed to be tough and rough, and, and we never run from a fight, and we never shed tears. But, but that's just unwise counsel. That's not even in the Bible. That's not even true. There's not a thing about that. Because when you look at this verse right here, he says, flee from sexual immorality. You know what the word flee means? It's the Greek word phugo, P-H-E-U-G-O, phugo. And it literally means to turn and to run from like you're running from a wild animal or a venomous snake. Anybody here afraid of snakes? Man, you know, I like them okay, but the, the poisonous ones, I mean, I'm going to turn and run. I'm not going to try to fool that deal. I'm not going to turn and run. And so he says here, we need to tell our children how important it is when that moment comes, when the temptation arrives, that we would turn and run. It's okay, son, for you to run. Turn and run. Turn and run. It's okay. We need to teach our kids this. Why is it so important? Look at verse 19. Do you not know that your bodies are temples? Now, some of ours are a little more disrepair than others. But your bodies are temples of what? Of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God who is in you, whom you have received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Oh, daddies, come on out here today, dad. Don't, don't shun away from this. Take the opportunity, every opportunity you can to be able to teach your sons and daughters these principles of life about sexual purity. Why? Because your kids will see things that they can never unsee. In a magazine, a computer screen, a telephone, they'll see things that they can never unsee you know mess with their minds they will touch things and experience things that they can never undo that can cost them for the rest of their lives this is important stuff and so let's let's move on for a second time so the, we talk about these key subjects of life like sexual purity and then self-discipline let's go to chapter 9 real quick all right stay with me don't check out don't check out 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're moving forward to the right, verse 24. He says, do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Oh, man, could we teach our sons and daughters self-discipline? It seems like we live in a day and age where there's very little self-discipline. But teach them, if you're going to run, run with all your heart. It's Colossians 3.23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. Could we teach our sons and daughters the importance of self-discipline? Let's read on. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it 
to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like somebody running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I preach to others, I myself may not be disqualified at the prize. We need to teach our, our children the discipline, your self-discipline of life. In athletics, if you're going to compete as an athlete, your son, your daughter is going to be an athlete, play baseball, basketball, football, tennis, track, whatever it is. Men say, say compete like you want to win the prize. If, if your son and daughter is in school, in academics, excel. Learn as much as you can. Be the best student you can possibly be. Have self-discipline with your physical health, the study of God's Word, uh, the, the practice of prayer, your dating life. Your work ethic, integrity, live out the gospel. Okay, dads, look at me right here. I'm going to tell you something important right now. You ready for this, dads? I don't care if your kid's 2 or 22 or 52. Your children do not need you to be their best friend. They need you to be their life coach. You get what I just said? Your sons and your daughters, men of God online, Morgan County men in this house, your sons and daughters don't need you to be their best friend. It's great that your kids like you and you like them and you love them. They love you. But your children's greatest need is not for you to be their best friend. It's for you to be their life coach. And life coach says hard things, good is good things, doesn't it? Self-discipline in every area of their life. So important. Help them to be everything God intended them to be. Number three, and I'm, I'm done, is that real fathers instruct their kids in the area of love. I want you to go to chapter 13. You know this chapter. It's so familiar. It's known as the love chapter. But I want to just highlight a few things here. First Corinthians 13, 1 Corinthians 13:1. Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and, and can fathom all the mis mysteries and, and knowledge and I have a faith that can move mountains but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. And then he begins to give a definition. I love this. Everybody should print this off and put it on your refrigerator. God's definition of love, verses 4 and following. Not the world's definition of love, but God's definition. Here's what he said, what it is and isn't. Love is patient. I'll teach your kids to be patient. Love is kind. Teach your children how to be kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud, verse 5. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. Oh, my goodness. Well, can we teach generation X and Y how to not make life all about them? Don't be self-seeking. Don't be so self-seeking. Don't be so self-involved. Because true love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. A lot of people misquote this. They say the Bible says don't be angry. It doesn't. It doesn't say that. Jesus got angry. Jesus even said, be angry and what? Sin not. He said, be angry, but don't sin. He said, it's not easily angered. Don't be easily upset. Don't be easily angered. Watch this. It keeps no record of wrongs. Hey, when she comes to you, when he says, babe, look, honey, love, I'm sorry. I messed up. I, I'm, a, I'm an idiot. I'm, forgive me. Let it go. Let that go. Don't keep record of wrongs in your marriage. Don't keep record of wrong with your children. Don't keep records of wrong with, with, with your friends. Don't let it go. Love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. It always, watch this, it always does what? Protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Hey, young ladies in the house, you looking for a man of God? He better have those four things. Come on, God gave you the, he gave you the, the prescription right here. Always. A, a true man of God, a true daddy, always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Verse 13, and now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is what? It's love. If we could teach our sons and daughters how to have a God-type love, an agape, God-type love, it would transform their marriage relationships. I mean, their marriages would be awesome if they learned how as children to have a God-type love. Wouldn't it be amazing? You know what? Here's the deal. If, 
if we could teach our children, listen to me, to have a God-type love for every person who walks, talks, and breathes upon the planet, racism would be gone in an instant, just like that. It's true. It's true. You remember what they said? They were trying to trap Jesus. You remember this? The religious leaders, the Pharisees of the day, they were trying to trap Jesus. And so they said publicly, hey, hey, Jesus, we've got all these laws. Come in. Which is the greatest? Jesus, oh, that's so easy. He says, the first is this, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And then one of them tried to go a little further, and he says, well, who is my neighbor? I'm kind of being sarcastic. Well, who is my neighbor? I love him. I know who my neighbor was. So Jesus tells this parable of the Good Samaritan. In the story, there's a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. They come across a guy who had been bunged up a little bit, and the only one who stopped was the Samaritan. And he patched up the guy's wounds, and he put him in a hotel, and he paid his fees. And so Jesus turned it back, and he says, so, so which, one was really, which one was really the neighbor? This is so amazing to me. And the religious people, they couldn't even bring themselves to say the name Samaritan. They said, probably look down, oh, probably it's the one who took care of the person. They couldn't even say Samaritan. Why? Because Samaritans were a multi-ethnic body. Here's what happened. All the way back in the Old Testament, 722 B.C., so God allows Israel to be taken out as bond slaves to Assyria, but there's a small remnant that remains. So there's Jews in Israel. And then all the Assyrians come in to Israel, and they mix and mingle and marry and have children and family, and boom, you have the Samaritans. Here's the problem. Nobody wanted them. The Jews didn't want them. The Greeks didn't want them. They were outcasts. And Jesus said, let me tell you who your neighbor is. Your neighbor is that Samaritan dude right there. If we could just teach our kids how to love, according to 1 Corinthians 13, prejudice and racism would be banished Dads, teach your kids how to love, how to love their wives, how to love their own children, how to love their neighbor. So important. I, if you look here. Let's close your Bibles. You can close your Bibles up in your sermon notebooks, but I need you. I need you for just a couple minutes because we need to respond to what we've heard today. This needs to mean something to us before we walk out of here. So what are the action steps? Here, here's the first one. Could you today... Let God begin to heal your father wounds. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor? Oh, I see it all over people. Many of us carry them all throughout our lives, father wounds. Might have, came from, might have come from your biological father. He may have said something to you, treated you in such a way, that embarrassed you, broke your heart, crushed your spirit, shamed you. You didn't feel like you were good enough. You didn't feel like you measured up. You got a father wound. It might not, not have been, your, might not have been your, your biological dad. It might have been a coach. Middle school, high school. Wounded you deeply. You got a father wound. Maybe it was a pastor. God forbid. Pastors mess up too. Maybe, maybe it was a pastor somewhere who, who broke your heart, broke your spirit, crushed you. You got a father wound in you. You've been carrying it around for all these years. You got a father wound. And it leads us, here, here's the deal, when you get a deep father wound, it leads men to become posers. What do I mean? Well, it leads you to two extremes. You either become excessively aggressive, you're always mad, you're always angry, you're always frustrated, you've got a short fuse, you're a fighter, you're a bully. It's a father wound. Or the other extreme is it leads you to become excessively passive. You just get dominated. You get walked over in life. You, you, you can't stand for anything. You have a hard time even communicating with your wife because you, you're so passive because you've got a deep father wound. Sometimes it just makes you the class clown. You ever met that guy? I mean, everything's funny. Always a joke. Always sarcastic. Always cutting somebody down. It's a father wound. There's something down deep inside of that man that makes him feel inadequate, insecure, and it's a cover-up. And so, so men become posers. But this is not how God wants us men to live our lives. No, this is not it. And, and so here's what I want to invite you to do today. Just speak it out to somebody. Because the devil's biggest trick in your life, especially as a man, 
It's to teach you, oh, you can't ever tell anybody that. They can't ever know that about me. They'll, they'll never love me. They'll never respect me. They'll, they'll, they'll distance themselves, but nothing could be further from the truth. Let me tell you something. Here's what the Bible says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the moment, men, listen to me, the moment you speak it out, the moment you speak it out, there's victory, there's healing, there's deliverance, and speaking it out to somebody to speak it out. And when you speak it out, your healing begins. I love what Pastor Chris Hodges shared with me. He's a pastor down in Birmingham, Alabama, a great man of God. He says, you're only as sick as your secret. Oh, my word. Somebody better write that down. That's powerful. You're only, man, sir, husband, daddy, you're only as sick as your secret. As long as you keep that bound up in your heart and your mind, you don't speak it out, you don't share it with anybody, it's going to take a toll on you. But the moment you begin to speak it out to another man of God, it'll bring about healing. So today, could you maybe start this journey? Could you maybe just be real, honest, transparent? Just forget what anybody else thinks for the very first time in your life. Would you just allow the Father to begin to speak into that deep father wound that you've been carrying around most of your life? Second thing I want to invite you to do today is find a father and be a father. Find a father, be a father. Uh, many of you uh, said, man, Pastor, I need a spiritual dad. I've never had a spiritual father. I need, would you ask God? Just ask God for one. Begin to pray today in this altar. Begin to pray, God, give me a spiritual father. Give me a man of God who's not just talking it, but walking it, living it out, that I can model my life after, that will walk with me, love me, encourage me, build me up, hold me accountable. Just ask God for a spiritual father. And when you get one, you begin to bring all these truths in your life. Then be a father to somebody else, right? As you get stuff, pour it back out, give out to others. And the third thing is this. Maybe it's time for, for many in the room today, men and women, just to, to run back to your heavenly father. You know, sometimes it becomes very difficult for us to relate intimately with our heavenly father because we never related intimately with our biological father. Oftentimes, you will view God the way you view your dad. And sometimes that can make you feel so distant, so far away from the Lord. And so maybe today the message for many is just that you would run back to your Heavenly Father. He hasn't moved. He never changes. I want to share this last verse as we get ready to pray and respond. James chapter 1, verse 17. I want to put it on the big screen. Every good... And perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights. Now watch this. Who does not change like shifting shadows. Oh, that's so important. You know what it means? It means that God will never turn his back on you. Shifting shadows. What, what that imagery is, is like, oh, oh, your dad, he's here with you, and then, then he turns his back on you. Oh, he, he loves you. Oh, no, now he's embarrassed of you. He's, he's building you up, now he's tearing you down. But your heavenly father's not this way. He's a good father who gives good gifts. He's a good, good father who loves you so well. And he's not like shifting shadows. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's worthy of your love, your praise, your ad admiration. So I just want to encourage you today that you serve a God who, who, who really never looks the other way. He's never embarrassed of you, never ashamed of you, shares unconditional love. He's worthy of your praise today. And maybe it's time that you just run back to him.